ready to master Google Classroom. From basic setup to advanced tips, we've got all you need to optimize your virtual classroom. Let's dive in and revolutionize your teaching experience. Number 1. Accessing Google Classroom. Here I am on my PC, and we'll begin with accessing Google Classroom. The simplest way is to open your web browser and head to the website classroom.google.com. I'm already logged in with my Google account, so it automatically takes me to the main Google Classroom interface. If you're using an account and haven't logged into Google Classroom before, it will prompt you to choose the Google account you want to use. You can either use a G Suite Education account or a regular consumer Gmail account. Number 2. Creating your first class. Now, as you can see, the view is rather empty because I haven't created or joined any classes yet. Up here in the top right hand corner, there's a helpful hint saying, create or join your first class. Since I'm a teacher, I'll choose, create class. Now, let's create our first class. Moving forward, it asks for some details about the class. Let's have some fun with this. For the class name, the only required field, let's say, Ed Arabia's YouTube class. Regarding sections, imagine if you have multiple sections of the same class. But for now, we'll keep it simple. Number 3. Customizing your class view. Since this is my first class, I'll simply name it, Section 1. As for the subject, it's a TV film production class. I'll select that one. Regarding the room, in my school, rooms are named after different UAE Emirates, and since we are from Dubai, let's name it the Dubai Room. That's all I need to create my class. Clicking on the Create button will finalize it. Now, back in the main Google Classroom view, you'll notice the header of my class with a nice visual and some additional information. Before we proceed to explore these features, let's customize the view a bit. The graphic currently displayed doesn't quite fit the topic of this class. So, to adjust this, I can select a theme. Clicking on Customize provides various categories. Additionally, you have the option to select one of these predefined themes, such as English, History, or Math. However, I prefer to upload my own photo. Clicking on Upload Photo, I'll select a picture from my computer, as who better to represent the professor of this class. After cropping it to fit, I'll choose that theme. Now, you can see the updated theme, offering a nice way to give your class its own identity. Number 4. Adding students to your class. In my current class view, it's a bit lonely because there are no students yet, given that I'm the teacher. The first way is by clicking on the People tab at the top of the page. Here, you'll see the student view. To invite students, I'll click on the icon of a person with a plus sign next to them. This allows me to invite students directly. For example, let's invite a student. I've sent the invitation to that student, they're quite diligent, so I'm sure they'll join my class. Now, let's explore another method to add students. Returning to the main page, you can click on the text in the top left-hand corner to navigate back. Alternatively, you can use the class code displayed here. Clicking on it will show a larger version of the class code. You can then copy this code. Now, if I were a student, I'd open another browser window, logged in with my student account. Clicking on the plus button in the top right hand corner, I'd select join class. Entering the class code and clicking join would add me to the class. Now, here I am in the student view of the class. Excitingly, there's no work due currently, but we'll change that very soon. Here I am back in the teacher's view. Now, I'll click back on the people tab, and you'll see that I have two different students, one I invited through the people view and another who joined using the class code I shared. You can share your class code with your students via email, messaging, or verbally instructing them to type in the code to join the class. These are the two different methods to invite or enroll students in your class in Google Classroom. Number 5. Engaging with students. Now that I have some students in my classroom, I want to welcome them. You can interact with your students within the mainstream view. This is where you can share things with your class. 
Clicking on this dialog box, I can choose whether to share with all students or select individual students to send the message to. I'm going to share this announcement with the entire class. I'll say, welcome to Ed Arabia's YouTube class, and add an exclamation mark to show my excitement. Down here, I can add different items such as a file from Google Drive, a link to a website, or even attach a file or YouTube video. I could attach various content to this post. Now, I have a few options. I could simply click on post and it'll appear in the stream for all of my students to see. But I also have this drop down menu. Clicking on it, I can choose to post it immediately or schedule it for later. For instance, if I wanted to go out at 5 a.m., making my students think I'm working really hard, I can do that. Alternatively, I could save it and come back to it later. In this case, I'll just go ahead and post it now. It's now posted for all my students to see. Let's switch to the student view. I'll refresh the classroom, and here, I can see. Number 6. Student Response and Interaction. As a student, I'm excited to respond, so I'll say, hey, I'm so excited, and send it back to my professor, maybe to make a good impression and keep the interaction going. This way, my professor feels heard. I've sent that in, and now back in the professor's view, I can refresh it and see the response from my student. As the professor, I have some options. I can reply to this comment, delete it if it's inappropriate, or if a student becomes annoying, I can mute all their comments. This gives me control to monitor and manage the conversation. The main stream view is where all upcoming content, assignments, and conversations will be visible. It's where you can see all the activity related to your class and any upcoming work. Number 7. Creating Assignments. Now that we've set up a class, added some students, and even started discussions, let's dive into the classwork section. Here, I'll show you how to create your first assignment. This is where you can assign work to your class, creating various types of content. Number 8. Exploring Content Creation Options. Clicking on the Create button, you'll see all the different types of content you can create. You can create an assignment, or a quiz using Google Forms, ask a question, post material, or even reuse a post. For instance, if you have multiple sections of a class and you've created an assignment for one section but want to use it for another, you can easily reuse it. You can also set up topics to organize assignments or quizzes under different categories. This allows you to organize things in a very structured manner. Number 9. Creating a basic assignment. For this example, let's create a basic assignment. Clicking on Assignment, I'll title it, Create Your First YouTube Video, Fitting for Our YouTube Class. It's important to provide guidance, so I'll include instructions such as, Your video should feature you, be at least two minutes long, and most importantly, be creative and enjoy learning. Under Add, I could attach different items to this assignment, such as a file from Drive, a link to a website, a file attachment, or a YouTube video. Google integrates other products seamlessly, so I could create a new docs, slide, sheet, drawing, or form. However, since this is a straightforward assignment, I won't be creating any additional items for now. On the right-hand side, I have several options. I can assign the task to all my students, or if there are particular students I want to target, I can assign the assignment specifically to them. I also have control over whether the assignment is graded and can define how many points it's worth. Let's go with 100 points for now, as that's typical on a 100 point scale. Number 10. Setting due date and topic. I can set the due date, which I'll make a week from today, on the 9th, and I'll set the time for 11.59 pm to give students the whole day. I can also assign the assignment to a topic. Maybe I'll create a new topic category for YouTube video. Number 11. Utilizing rubric for assessment. At the bottom, there's an option for a rubric. Let's explore that. Clicking on it, I'll create a rubric. This allows for more detailed assessment criteria. I've set up a couple of criteria. The video needs to be at least two minutes long, 
which earns 50 points, and the student must appear in the video, also worth 50 points. It's a straightforward grading system with these two criteria. Now that I've set up the rubric, I'll go ahead and save it. I've created the assignment, and now I have some options. I can click Assign to immediately give this assignment to my students. Alternatively, I could schedule it to go out later. For instance, if I don't want to stress students out before the weekend, I might schedule it to go out on Monday. In this case, I'll assign it now for simplicity, but scheduling can be useful for timing assignments appropriately. Number 12. Finalizing the assignment. Now, my first assignment is ready. It appears in the classwork section under the video category with the title, create your first YouTube video. If I click into the assignment, I can see additional details and manage it further. Number 13. Submitting assignments. Now, as a student, I notice that my professor has posted the first assignment, create your first YouTube video. Let's explore it further by clicking on it. Here, the instructions specify that the video should be at least two minutes long and encourage creativity and enjoyment. Additionally, there's a grading rubric available for reference. This seems reasonable to me. Now, to submit my assignment, I'll click on Add or Create. I have the option to upload a file from Google Drive, add a link, or create a document directly using docs, slides, sheets, or drawings. Once I've completed the assignment, I'll attach it accordingly. Since it's a YouTube video, I'll insert a link to the video I'm submitting. Number 14. Interacting with the teacher. So, what I could do now is express gratitude for this enjoyable assignment. I might try to impress the professor again with a thank you note. After sending this comment, it will reach the teacher, who may respond if there are any questions or if assistance is needed. Once I've attached the necessary item and everything looks satisfactory, I'll proceed to submit the assignment. It's worth mentioning that the comment I sent was private to the teacher, but I could also make a class-wide comment if I have a question for my peers or the class. Now, let's submit the assignment. Upon confirmation, I'll turn in my work. Although there's an option to retract the submission, I'm content with my work, so I'll proceed. Number 15. Viewing Grades and Feedback Returning to the main class view, there are various student functionalities available. For instance, I can navigate to the classwork section to get an overview of all upcoming assignments, which is a convenient way to organize the different content. Number 16. Grading Assignments. So, I've completed grading the assignment, and I might write a comment like, thank you so much. You're a fantastic student, and send it back to my student. Now that I've graded it and provided feedback, I can return it to the student. Clicking on Return, I can optionally add another comment before finalizing. Upon clicking Return, the assignment is sent back to the student. Now, I'll switch back to the student view and refresh the page. Here, I can check my score, which is a perfect 100 out of 100. Additionally, I can see my teacher's response. Number 17. Exploring Classroom Features Next, we'll head back to the main class view. So far, we've delved into three main areas, the stream, classwork, and people. Our next move is to access the grades section, which functions as the gradebook overview. Here, I can gather different insights, like the class average, which helps me assess how the students are performing overall. Each assignment has its column, displaying individual student scores. Additionally, I can click on each assignment to review submissions if required, offering a thorough overview of the class's progress and facilitating efficient grade monitoring. Number 18. Customizing Settings. After covering these primary sections, let's move on to exploring the available options by accessing Settings. Here, you can adjust various parameters previously set. These settings remain flexible, you can revisit and modify them as needed. Alright, let's return to the main classroom view. Number 19. Mobile Accessibility. This interface serves as the main Google Classroom platform. 
Additionally, if I want to access Google Classroom on my mobile phone, I can do so by downloading the app from the Play Store or the App Store. The app offers almost identical functionality to the web version, making it convenient for staying connected with my class while on the go and responding to students' needs. Thank you for watching our Google Classroom tutorial. We hope you've gained valuable insights to enhance your teaching journey. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more tech tutorials like this. Until next time, happy teaching and learning.